You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. We have barely dipped our toes in September, and already I am so busy I have talked myself hoarse. And I am just about to go back on tour again, which means that decent meals at decent times are going to be just out with my grasp. And like the lead up to travel in gigs, I am all over the place that I just don't have the time or like the mental capacity to plan and organise decent grub for myself. Things would be so much easier for me if I had access to something like factors, no prep, no mess meals. But living here in rural Ireland, I can't. But I did get one of my besties to actually try it out for me. And she really enjoyed the Indian butter tofu, lentils and rice with curry spiced spinach and potatoes. The best of all of the vegetables. Like she was saying it even smelt good frozen. And the fact that it was ready in only two minutes. No prepping, no shopping, no clean up. Just fantastic. Now she's veggie and was worried there wasn't going to be like that great of a selection, but she had so much choice. So whether you're looking for something meat-free, to manage your calories, or to increase your protein intake, there's a meal plan to fit your lifestyle. So head to factormeals.com slash whatnow50 and use code whatnow50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code WHATNOW50 at factormeals.com slash WHATNOW50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. If your business needs a new application, then developers will have to write code. A lot of code. If an application needs to be modernized, then you'll need time, resources, and caffeine. If this sounds daunting, then use Watson X Code Assistant. Built with IBM's Granite Code Model, it's AI designed to multiply developer productivity so you can generate code quickly. Learn more at ibm.com slash codeassistant. IBM, let's create. to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlewood, history harlot and reader of books. Speaking of books, I'm going to be performing at the Redline Book Festival on October 19th in Dublin in the Civic Theatre in Tala, where you'll find out one of your favourite writers isn't quite who they seem, but they really are, are they? Now, this episode was supposed to be something else, something very harrowing and hard-hitting and, oh God, just content warning, content warning, content warning, really. And it is midnight. I was supposed to record this several hours ago, but instead I've been in a back and forth with somebody who works for my podcast network. And to say I am angry, I'm actually beyond angry at this point, I'm exhausted and I I just don't have the emotional or mental capacity to do the original plan. So it's it's next week's episode that is this week because typically I bookmark uh, the really like harrowing stuff with something fun either side because I'd rather not you know uh, torture us with trauma I feel. I feel like that's a bit much to do every single week and I do try and space it out but there was some stuff I just I was reminded of by someone and I was like, oh no, I need to, I need to talk about this. But again, I'm just, I'm so done. Ah, oh, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber and fact me. In fact, you I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are, who was Agent 355? By Paul Aaron. George Washington, spy master. How the Americans outspied the British and won the Revolutionary War by Cheryl Harness and Thomas B. Allen. Agent 355 by Mark Anthony Phelps. Agent 355, The American Revolution's Most Mysterious Female Spy, by Ellen Gutesky. Women Heroes of the American Revolution, by Susan Casey. Washington Spies, The Story of America's First Spy Ring, by Alexander Rose. Turncoats, Traitors and Heroes, by John Bakeless. 
An Encyclopedia of American Women at War, From the Home Front to the Battlefields, by Kevin M. Brady. And of course we have our favourites, History.com and Biography.com. I use it uncomfortably. Good. Then let's begin. This week's tale is historical mystery. And by historical mystery, I mean we don't actually know if it happened or not. Is it myth? Is it lore? Is it fact? Is it fiction? We don't know. Like, that's the beauty of this story. And that's why it's a little bit lighter this week. Oh yeah, see? I think about you. I care. I now have to think of another nice story for two weeks' time. But it's fine. I'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. I got you. I got you. So yes, we are talking about Agent 355, the secret lady spy of George Washington, who helped win the Revolutionary War, who may or may not have existed. But, I mean, she's a woman from the past. Whom's to say? So, allegedly, allegedly, Agent 355 was a member of the Culper spy ring. Culper? Cooper? You know what? I've never actually heard it said aloud. I've only ever read it, so I could be mispronouncing this completely. But it is what it is. Um, If I'm wrong... Yeah, I'm sure some someone will always tell me. There's always someone to correct me on my pronunciation, isn't it? And Agent 355 is supposedly this instrumental figure in this Manhattan, Long Island spy ring. And the only reason we know anything about Agent 355 is from a letter from Abraham Woodhull. And it's it's like in passing, but it gripped everyone's attention and people have been obsessing over the lore of Agent 355 ever since. But, again, fact, fiction, truth, lore. Was she real? Wasn't she real? Does it matter? Hmm. But, before we get into Agent 355, the lady spy, we should probably touch on the the context and background. Now, if you're from the US and you're listening... You probably know this bit, but for other people, yeah, we don't really get taught the intricacies of your history. This may shock you, but most people aren't. Uh, Some of us did study American history. I mean, I think I only started from the 1840s, but it's been a while since I was in college, so I don't remember exactly. Anywho, the American Revolution. What was it? Well, it it was a revolution. Uh, this may shock you. It was a revolt uh, against against the British. What? Who would do that? We are shocked and have never seen this happen before in history, ever. So yes, the thirteen American colonies, because Britain had colonized America, or what would become the USA. And they'd colonised it and they were fighting for independence, like, from Britain. And King George III, you know him, yes, he of uh, musical fame and also shagging Queen Charlotte. That is, that is, going, going mad, I suppose. The madness of King George, big deal. But yes, that is the one. So he is desperate for money because, in another shocking twist... England is having another dick measuring contest with France. Say what? Yes, exactly. So, listen, England, France, always sparring, always fighting, so much war. But um, wars, as a general rule, are expensive. And so, they need money. So, in order to make money, they decide to raise taxes. And by raising taxes, I mean they tax the colonies. So Parliament in the UK, it passes a law called the Stamp Act in 1765, which meant taxing anything that was like printed. So you're talking like newspapers, legal papers, like anything stamped. You get it? Like, mm. And that that was just a way of making money. And of course, you know, shit wasn't digital back then. Most stuff was like done on a printing press or whatnot. So a lot of their, like, legal work and a lot of their, like, news, all of that was being taxed to fuck. 
and they weren't too keen on it. Now, the, the colonists, they were getting a wee bit tetchy about it because one, it's a lot of fucking money, and two, they didn't have representation. So, like, there was no one to represent the colonies, like, over in the British Parliament to, like, act on their behalf. Like, and this is sort of a common thing, like, like India didn't have representatives, you know, I'm trying to think of Ireland, didn't really have representatives, the whole thing. But, like, all the places that Britain colonised, like, they didn't have representatives in, like, Parliament in Britain to fight for rights in the areas that had been colonised and to fight for, like, forms of governance and taxation and all that. Like, they didn't have it. So, yeah, there's this tiny island and it's controlling your your country, you know, your livelihood, all that stuff. And so they're already, they've already got a wee chip on their shoulder about that. And then a few years later, a bunch of new laws are passed thanks to Charles Townsend, which leads to the Townsend Act. And it taxes so much more. You've got paper, glass, paint, lead and tea all being taxed in colonial ports. Now, this made them even less happy, for example. Like, there were 13 colonies. Each had their own sort of laws and they sort of governed themselves, which is why states tend to have their own laws now, generally, as opposed to like an all-encompassing, like, one shoe fits all scenario. One shoe fits all? No, one size fits all. I mean, I mean, unless it's a magic shoe, we're not going to get into it. Stop. No. So, they had their own sort of stuff to deal with and their own money, and they were sort of left to rule themselves, and they were quite content with this, and now they're having extra taxes upon taxes and levies and charges what? Like, honestly, I think people look at the taxation thing today and it's like, we fought for not having this. And yet here you are. Anyway, so initially the colonies are like, we're not too happy with this. And we don't want you to control us. We don't want that. We want to rule ourselves. And, you know, they protest peacefully. Like they try, they're like, hey, they have their wee white flags and banners and flowers into the bayonets. Like, it's chill. Uh, they do these peaceful protests. And then um, the British government does the completely rational act of sending a fuck ton of soldiers to Boston. And this leads to uh, the Boston Massacre. They start shooting into the crowd on March 5th. And... It, it just, it was the spark that ignited the war, really. Like, everyone talks about the tea, but it's it's this that really just caused, like, a huge, a huge commotion. Like, it really turned people who were sitting on the fence, you know? So, the very same day, March 5th, 1770, Parliament decides to scrap, like most of the town's end, like, act. But they do keep the tax on tea, which which is probably why most Americans drink coffee now, because they're like, fuck you and your tea. And um, in 1773, so three years after this, they passed another law, which basically made it cheaper for British companies to sell their tea than colonists to sell their tea. So if you had a wee shop and you were selling tea and you were like an American company, like you lived in America, you're like two generations in and you're like selling that. And then you've got a British company coming in and setting up a shop, like their tea is going to be cheaper than your tea, which did not, did not go down well. 
And because they're like, oh, well, you're going to charge us more for tea? Eh, no, take your tea and shove it. And so they dump it into the harbour. So they start boarding all these ships in the port and just like start chucking it into the Boston Harbour, which is basically the Boston Tea Party, which just led to the, the harbour just having very salty tea, really. Like, one thing, I understand that tea has significantly less caffeine in it than coffee, but if you're dumping all that fucking tea into this one area, like, it's going to mess up any fish that are there. Like, they're going to have the jettles. Just, like, a wee jittery fish just flopping about. Oh, I didn't know there was flying fish here. Uh, the, there isn't. What's up with them? Not a fucking clue. And this may shock you, but instead of chilling the hell out... Britain decided to pass even more laws, harsher ones still, because British Parliament, Parliament is a petty bitch. And they closed all the ports, they basically stopped all trade until Boston paid back the cost of the tea that had been thrown overboard. And then all of Massachusetts was under like martial law it was military rule like it was shocking and having eyes the colonies were like eh this is not good and they are really having a show of force here and it becomes very clear that the only way the colonies are going to have any self-control anything like that is by taking it if they want to govern themselves they're going to have to fight and they're going to have to do it together And so the following year, 1774, like every colony, apart from Georgia, like they all meet in Philadelphia and put together the Continental Congress. And they're like, hey, you want to stop giving us these dodgy laws, please? Thanks. And Britain was like, no, here's more soldiers. Shut the fuck up. And so by 1775... Three million colonists, like, living on the East Coast, right? From Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting angrier and angrier. Now, for the most part, a lot of the colonists were just kind of chill with existing. They weren't necessarily looking for independence. They just wanted Britain to, you know not being the domineering stepdad of the situation and just let them sort of live their lives. They wanted to have the option of like certain forms of self-governance. They didn't want such high taxes and they wanted representatives in British Parliament. But yeah, that, that wasn't that wasn't on the cards. And so they had to sort themselves out. So they were organising supplies, they were setting up their own military and they were... Basically, I'm not saying doomsday prepping, but because, you know, they were actually prepping for their doomsday because they, they knew that war was on the horizon because there was no other choice. Like, if they wanted, you know, uh, colonial autonomy, then they, they were going to have to fight for it. They knew there was going to be a massive battle and that's just how it was. And and they, they knew that it was it was unlikely that they would win. Um, because massive colonial power against them. You know, this is a nation that has conquered the majority of the world. Like, the most common holiday of countries is an Independence Day specifically from Britain. And so the colonists decided that they were going to fight, they were going to go down swinging, or they were going to maybe, hopefully, possibly, a teeny weeny bit win. And so the Second Continental Congress meets. They basically consolidate all of their like individual armies to make the Continental Army and put George Washington in charge. And on the 4th of July, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is approved by the Continental Congress with the all 13 colonies becoming united eh, eh, as the United States of America. And then they fight for a couple of years. So July, they declare war. August, 
Britain takes New York. So British forces, they're occupying New York and it's a stronghold there. And they hold it for like the entire war, effectively. And because this is a British stronghold, it's an important place to be. And it is a treasure trove of information. Which, of course, leads us to the Culper spy ring and Agent 355. Because this is an area to collect intelligence. Like, this is... This is the spot. Intelligence agents were almost invaluable during the American Revolution. Like, they were an integral part to winning the war. And Washington actually based a lot of his plans and structured a lot of his military operations based on intelligence garnered by spies. But being a spy isn't all it's cracked up to be because it's not the safest of occupations. Like Nathan Hill, he was hanged without trial in New York because it was discovered he was leaking British military secrets back to his regiment. And so people weren't exactly chomping at the bit to be a spy because, you know, the threat of a short drop and a sudden stop. And so the Revolutionary Army jumped at the chance of getting their hands on someone willing to spy for them. The general, George Washington, he was desperate to get a spy ring going on in New York. Like, he needed something going on. Like, the first person he recruits is just, like, a merchant. Nathaniel Sackett of Fishkill. Like, just a regular merchant. Because, in fairness, nobody's going to worry about talking around someone who's just, like, selling you, I don't know, fish. His name's Fishkill. So I'm going to assume there's some fish involved. And Nathaniel's military contact was this dude from Long Island, Benjamin Talmadge, who was an officer in the army. He, like, moved up the ranks pretty sharpish, and he was fairly decent at passing on information. And so Washington brings Nathaniel in to be another cog in this wheel, to be another link in the chain in this network. But he's not very good at it. And so they're like, we need to get rid of him and find someone else. And so he's like filling up the spots and he just needs this one sort of New York space filled. And he's really trying to sort this network. And then he receives a letter on the 7th of August, 1778. And this is the starting point. So yeah, he receives a letter from Lieutenant Caleb Brewster from Long Island who had kind of already been involved, sending messages from uh, John Clark, who was, like, originally from Long Island and then went back to Philadelphia. Um, So they'd been doing, like, spy stuff between him and Talmadge, and he was doing these things. So he was a friend of Talmadge as, like, a childhood friend. Like, he'd known him all his life. And Brewster offered to, like, collect intelligence on Long Island. Which is fine, but they did need someone to like manage sort of what was going on there. And so Washington pulls in Brigadier General Charles Scott, a commander of the Virginia Brigade. And he brings him in to like really set up a spy network. And he's like, Talmadge, get in there, start helping him. Now, I mean, they say if you want a good job done, you got to do it yourself. But this dude... Brigadier Charles Scott, he's just, his heart's not in it. He doesn't have um, the necessary motivation required to establish and run an entire spy network. And so all of this ends up back on Talmadge, who's basically doing the job himself anyway, and ends up as like the intelligence chief, because Scott ends up resigning because he's just not doing his job anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And Washington's like, son, can you do it? And Talmadge is like, yes, I can. So because Talmadge is like, he's a native of Long Island, that's where he's from, that's where he grew up, and so he decides to recruit people that he knows, that he can trust, people he's known since childhood. He's got Robert Townsend, Austin Rowe, Caleb Brewster, as previously mentioned, um, Abraham Woodhull, Jonas Hawkins, and like a bunch of other dudes. 
Now, there were more to this, you see, but they all had code names and aliases, so we they're a bit more tricky to sort of decipher. But yeah, intelligence agents, spies, of course they have bloody code names. And so, like, uh, they start changing you've got um benjamin talmage becomes john bolton which is a wee bit like ah this is ezekiel jones what is he changing his name to tim smith all right same as a bit right but yeah you've got abraham woodhull becomes samuel copar um robert townsend becomes samuel cooper jr they're just like, oh, look, I'm just writing a letter to my father. It's completely normal and not suspicious. And obviously this is where the name the Cooper spy ring comes from. But it worked really, really well because they all knew each other. They were all very close anyway. They were friends. Like, this was a pretty solid, solid network. And so they would use their general lives to get together and, and you know, enact their spy craft and it wouldn't be suspicious because if you're visiting your cousin right you're just visiting your cousin it's not weird because you're hanging out anyway or if you're going to your neighbor's shop it's not weird because it's your neighbor's shop of course you're gonna buy from your neighbor like it's so like below the radar so normal that it doesn't attract suspicion it's just my uncle's birthday party. Nobody's sharing military secrets here. So anyway, members of this spy ring, they would sort of collect um, intelligence information, sort of uh, military manoeuvres, you know, bits and pieces, which would be sent back to Washington, who would use this to formulate his play. But like, they couldn't just write, Dear Mr. Washington, here are the military manoeuvres in South Boston. No, no, not at all. What they had to do was write in code and send it carefully because you don't want it to end up like accidentally being found by the enemy and then being like, shit, these people are gathering intelligence. Let's go stab them with a bayonet. It's always the bayonets, guys. Can't help myself. And so they are writing in code. And Talmadge, he creates this sort of system. It's a collection of numbers that are assigned to 763 commonly used words. Um, so like language was 361, mercenary was 603, Long Island was 728, New York City 727, injuries 311, and even the names, even the names were assigned. So Washington was 711, uh, Abraham Woodhull was 722, Townsend was 723. They all have assigned letters. Now, if a word was like out with this commonly used letter system, then the sort of jumbled up alphabet was kind of used. Now, just to make sure that they were not caught to like really reinforce this, not only did they have code names, write their letters in a numerical code, but they also wrote it in invisible ink. Like, like talk about being sure, like they were taking no chances. They even wrote another letter on top of the invisible ink letter, like, and it was generally typical boring stuff that if you picked up the like dearest whomever jim bob and sue ellen have got a tickly cough how are those socks you bought you know like really boring mundane normal stuff just enough to be innocuous to like not raise suspicion now a lot of this information was actually collected by robert townsend himself because he was like a merchant and a shop owner but he was also a society journalist so it wasn't suspicious to see him hanging about writing things down. So he was able to collect information at all of these like society, you know, meetings, gatherings, like all the stuff he went to. Like he was able to collect information from the British because 
yeah, it wasn't weird for him to be writing or to be taking notes because he's a society journalist. And so he would pass his information to Austin Rowe, who had a tavern, and this would then go to Abraham Woodhull, who would then take it to Caleb Brewster, who would go to Talmadge, who would then go to Washington. Like, pillar to post, pillar to post, it was always going round. But, of course, it wasn't just the men. Now, the culprit spying, it's like it's mainly these dudes, and we don't really have any acknowledgement, for the most part, about the part that women played here. But there were, there were women involved. I mean, of course, we have the mysterious Agent 355. But also, we had people like Abraham Woodhull's neighbour, Anna Strong. And she would use her washing line, her clothes line, to let the ring know that intelligence needed to be collected. So uh, she would hang up a black petticoat, meaning that Caleb Brewster was in town. And to find out where he was hiding, she would put like a certain number of like white hankies like up on the line. And because Woodhull's the neighbour next door, he would look at the washing line and go, ah, okay. And then he'd go and meet Caleb Brewster. Like, this is one of those stories which is very much an allegedly, but it's so weird, it feels like it should be true. Like, if something is weird enough, but could also be real, if it's from history, typically there's a chance that that happened. It's weird enough to be real, and people are suspicious and paranoid enough to do things like that. And, like, it was discovered in recent years that Anna's husband was an active member of the Cobra spy ring. And so... Again, it's a woman, people weren't really paying attention to her, so it feels like not really out of the question for her to be involved in this. But I know we're halfway through the episode, and you want to hear about Agent 355, but first, let's hear from her sponsors. Or if you don't hear from the sponsors, enjoy this moment of solitude. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. Looking to invest? Start your journey by exploring exchange-traded funds with GlobalX ETFs. Exchange-traded funds, or ETFs for short, create baskets of stocks, bonds, and other assets that you can buy in a single trade. GlobalX specializes in ETFs that track emerging trends, like the rise of artificial intelligence, as well as strategies aimed to generate income potential. Visit GlobalXETFs.com to discover how you can get started. And we're back and ready to talk about Agent 355. So there are almost 200 letters, 193 to be exact, that survive about the Cooper spy ring. And out of those 193, only one makes reference to a woman. The only one, ever. So there's this letter from Woodhull to Washington, dated 1779, the 15th of August. And it states... I intend to visit 727 before long, and think by the assistance of 355 for my acquaintance, shall be able to outwit them all. So that's the sentence, right? So 727 is the code for New York, like as I said earlier, and 355 is the code for lady. So, I intend to visit New York before long, and think by the assistance of lady for my acquaintance shall be able to outwit them all. Now, a lot of research went into this, and we know that on the day that he was travelling, Abraham Woodhull was accompanied by a woman on this journey. We don't have any information regarding who this woman is, who this lady is. Her name, her face, her features, nothing. And... These are not the kind of details people wrote down then because it's a woman from the past and 
typically women weren't really seen as dangerous they weren't a bother they weren't worrisome they were too emotional they couldn't be involved in a war say what no because they're typically underestimated by men all men sidebar i had a power lifter a female power lifter complain to me because she said that i was victimizing myself by saying that men tend to get angry at women who know more than them which is just a factually correct statement and i have evidence of that just in my comment section right <laughs> just consistently and yeah she got really mad about it and then she went on this whole big rant and i was like i can't be arsed listening to your nonsense anymore so i just blocked her because i don't need that internalized misogyny in my life no but yeah back during the revolutionary war the patriarchy misogyny it's just woven into the fabric of history however the colonists figured out pretty early on that a person who's overlooked is a pretty good spy like they're they're a pretty good asset to have and because women are generally undervalued underestimated or even ignored they were a very valuable asset indeed i mean they were pretty good at being spies because they could get into certain areas they could arrive at certain situations that men couldn't they could enter households as domestic servants maids cooks etc because people would assume that you know, they were just normal ladies living their life, doing their chore and not really being bothered by much, you know. Why would they consider or be bothered by, you know, a big bad war? You know, they got pots to scrub and sandwiches to make. Unsurprisingly, a fair amount of women were quite happy to become spies because, you know, women are people too. Because it's one of the only things they could do at the time to help their country unless they were nursing even. But for the most part, passing on information, providing information, it was like one of the few ways they could actually, you know, be involved in the revolution and actually help, you know, and do their part in it. And so typically the Continental Army, the Patriots, they would get their wives to pass along notes and messages because, of course, no one would suspect them of doing anything. They're just ladies gossiping or going about their daily business. And, yeah, they would go places. They were not really noticed. They kind of just breezed through a lot of the time. It would take a lot for men to become suspicious of women, you know, because they just assumed they were inferior. Now, back to Agent 355, who, it's interesting, we call her Agent, even though back then nobody called themselves Agent, they just gave themselves new names. And like, we don't even have a code name for her, just the number, unless our code name is Lady. Lady is the code name. But yeah, Agent wasn't really a term they used back then, it wasn't part of the historical vernacular, like it just wasn't part of it. And so, uh, we, it wasn't used then, but we can use it now because we want to and we can. So there are all these theories about who Agent 355 was. Like, who was she? Who was the mysterious woman who accompanied Abraham Woodhull? And so the biggest sort of suspect, the top of the list is... Anna Strong, the neighbour, she of the petticoat and hankies fame. And there's like a lot, a lot of support for this. Again, we don't really know that much about 355, but there's like a strong obsession with this. So when you think back to his letter, Abraham Woodhull is saying that I intend to visit New York and think by the assistance of a lady of my acquaintance shall be able to outwit them all. And so he's bringing a lady with him back to New York. Who could be the lady that he is acquainted with? Anna Strong. Now, 
I don't know if it would be appropriate for him and Anna to like travel alone together. It feels like that might be inappropriate for the time. Now there is a theory that the acquaintance of the lady is actually Anna's husband, Seller Strong. Now there is this whole thing about is Seller like an actual spy? Is he a member of the spy ring? Like he gets reimbursed for like culprit spy ring activities, but he's not involved in a lot of this stuff at this point because he's imprisoned. Like he's not doing spy things. Because he's in jail. Like, there's not a lot he can do. Now, he's reimbursed, but he's not doing any spying. But who is spying is his wife, who isn't allowed to have her own money or property. And so, the reimbursement for spycraft would go to the husband and not to Anna. And it wouldn't be too suspicious for Anna wanting to visit New York because her husband is imprisoned there. So she has every valid reason to travel into the area and for it to not, like, raise any eyebrows. Because her husband is on a prison ship. They're, yeah, instead of, like, an actual stolen prison, he's on a ship. The HMS Jailsy. It's a British prison ship. And the majority of prisoners on it, uh, they, they would tend to die of starvation. And so Anna would often visit and bring food with her. Because, you know, her husband starving to death didn't really seem like a good idea to her. And also, I mean, there was also disease. But depending on how cramped it was, it's very much a maybe situation. So she was used to being on board the ship. They probably were used to seeing her and it wasn't odd or peculiar for her to go visit. So maybe she did overhear things. Maybe she did pass on information. Whom's to say? Now, eventually... She manages to get Sailor paroled because she's got relatives who are loyalists, right? So she's got royalists and she manages to get him out. And when she does get him released, they just like love happily ever after. Like, they're pretty chill. Now, the alternatives for Agent 355. Well, one is connected to Major John Andre. Now, he was the chief of British intelligence who at the time was considered to be New York's most eligible bachelor. Pretty easy fodder for like a female spy, don't you think? Just some dude who's an absolute horn dog, not just Hamilton. And Andre, he loved the ladies, but he didn't quite see them as, you know, people, which is not super. And so there comes a woman, Lydia Dara. Lydia's family are loyalists, they are supporters of Britain. They're supporters of, you know, British rule. They are big into King George. They're like, yes, I love this man and his crown and his wee pantalons. We're so into it. And so the Daras, because their house is, well, a loyalist house, meetings are held there. Like, important meetings, important British military meetings with Major John Andre. Now Lydia wasn't really big into the whole praising King George scenario and so she would listen at the door collecting information from these super secret British military meetings and would then collect and pass this information on to Washington so that he could work out military strategies and whatnot. Now you might be thinking, what turned Lydia against, you know, the royalist family of hers? Well, Lydia happens to be Irish. And as such, not too fond of the British. A couple of hundred years of issues there. And so she's like, yeah, no love lost. I'm gonna go pass on this super secret information. So Washington gets news of a pending attack and he is ready for it. And it becomes very clear that there's only one place the leak could have come from and they need to plug it. And Andre, he is super suspicious and he questions every single member of the household apart from Lydia because he assumed that Lydia, being a woman, would hold the same political views as her royalist husband. 
And because he trusted Lydia's husband, he trusted Lydia. And so as long as he was using the Dara house, like information about attacks and strategies, like they were getting head out to the Cobra spy ring, left, right and centre. But when he ended up leaving and going to South Carolina in 1779, the information kind of petered out a little bit. There's actually a letter from George Washington to Alexander Hamilton about this. He's like... Yeah, I'm not really getting enough info at this point, buddy. Like, he says the co-perspiring is, like, useless. It's, like, absolutely useless. And it's from the point where he leaves the Dara household. Well, Andre leaves the Dara household. So was Lydia Agent 355? Now, remember, Andre is an eligible bachelor, after all. He is a ladies' man, man's man, man about town. And, like... Who knows what he was bumping his gums about trying to, like, bed the ladies. And so he goes away. Not a lot of information happens. But when he returns in 1780, so he leaves in 1779, back in 1780, and the information just starts coming back. Like, this wasn't just chump change. This was massive info. Like, one of the reports they got was... Uh, an American general was going to like turncoat, he was going to surrender himself at West Point, which was like a really big turning point like for the war and it was going to be this whole thing and he was going to betray everybody and what do you know, General Benedict Arnold, he had command at West Point and he was about to surrender to the Brits, why? For money bloody money and Arnold's correspondent the person he was dealing with was Andre and so so Talmadge gets wind of this he writes in the letters and he passes this info on he's saying like we need to do something like unexpected and shocking because like shit's about to go down because you know this general knows American forces he knows our power plays he knows all of it And what do you know Talmadge was right? But where was Talmadge getting his info? None other than Agent 355 who exposed this subterfuge, this ruse. Which did result in the capture of Major John Andre, who had maps of West Point and letters signed by one Benedict Arnold. Now, because of this abundance of evidence, it's clear that Andre and Arnold are in cahoots. And it doesn't take too long for Andre to confess. And then he is hung. Shot drop, sudden stop. Arnold, however, managed to flee. So because it was quite apparent that someone very close to the now deceased, Major John Andre had been spilling his secrets and... This sort of turned up the heat in the kitchen a wee bit. And several members of the Goldberg ring just fled. They escaped and they went into hiding. Um, Most came out after a couple of weeks, but yeah, yeah, they were all like, shit, off we go. Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. Now in fairness, like, a good few people did get arrested. It was a whole situation. Because anybody who had any connection to Andre was being rounded up, they were being questioned, and they again were trying to plug this leak in British occupied territory. And this whole thing really upsets Townsend. Like, he is just distraught at the whole thing. Like, he, he's writing letters about so many of his friends being arrested, and he just buggers over to Woodhull's house because he's just like struggling with this. And he's going on about how he's going to quit spying. Like this man is feeling all of his feelings. Like he is struggling. And he's going on about how he just can't do this anymore. Like maybe something snapped in him. And like he's like, I can't do it anymore. And then steals a bunch of shit. Like he says, fuck this for a game of soldiers and just starts nicking stuff. He grabs all this money. He even steals £600 in 10 days, which is like, which in today's money is a fuck ton of cash. 
And he even steals from his own dad, like that's how desperate he is. And it's it's like a lot, it's a lot to like turn on everything you know, steal from all your friends and businesses, and then try and try and just do a runner. Why? Like why would someone who was so integral to this just suddenly snap? Like is, is being arrested like the worst thing? Or was Townsend very close and very connected to his informant? A lady, perhaps. And this leads us to another possibility for Agent 355. In October 1790, when all these people were being rounded up and arrested, one of which was a pregnant woman, like, she's getting questioned and interrogated and she is giving them nothing, which is, if you're already dealing with pregnancy hormones and if you are pregnant enough for people to be aware that you're pregnant, like, there are so many hormones in there, there are so many emotions, like, the fact that she hasn't, like, head-butted one of the inventory is just pure luck at this point. So the theory goes that Townsend is a co-creator of the fetus growing inside this pregnant woman. Or he was specifically attached to this woman because she was pregnant. Perhaps she was down and out, perhaps she was a widow. Whom's to say? But he had some very intense bond with her. And so he was trying to get this money together, allegedly, to buy her freedom. This woman ends up on the HMS Jersey. The prison ship. What again? Yes. Content warning. Uh, maternal death. Skip forward a minute if it's going to be too tough for you. So while on the prison ship, the woman gives birth. And I don't know, the lack of tools, medical professionals, knowledge, consideration. She passes away. What happens to the baby? We don't know. There's like no info specifically on that, but chances are not great. And after this woman dies, Townsend, I mean, he continues spying, but he's not there anymore. The light behind his eyes, gone. All we know is that compared to everyone else in the spy ring, Robert Townsend specifically was incredibly close to the woman who died on the ship. What their connection was, we don't know. But he was very, very close to her. And, like, the Townsend's actually, like, near enough everybody else. Like, it's an occupied territory. And so there are enemy soldiers, like, being held in your home. Like, you're hosting them. It's a thing. And the Townsend's, like everyone else... They had enemy soldiers in their home too. So, perhaps someone in his household was sharing information? And, like, the funniest thing as well is, like, Robert Townsend, like, he never tells George Washington his real name. He is, like, the most super secretive out of the spies. He's, like, the most spy-y out of all the spies. And so he just doesn't share that information. And, like, we don't even find out that he's part of, like, the spy ring for... Like, so long after it happened. But yeah, he was more connected to this woman. But was she 355? Maybe. And, like, at this point, you know, after this, you know, roundup and these deaths and whatnot, the informant stops informing. There is one final theory, though, of Agent 355. And that is of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a teenage, formerly enslaved woman. Now think about it, if you are a person of this era, like, and you think women aren't worth your time or your consideration, imagine what an enslaved person would be. Like, you wouldn't really consider them, a lot of the time, even existing like part of the furniture like they could move through and be your servant and collect that information and they wouldn't bat an eye like they probably thought they weren't smart enough to even do that like many other enslaved and formerly enslaved people elizabeth again who's like 17 at this point she is made to serve serve 
soldiers, infantrymen, you know, British royalists. And of course, being a woman of colour, like she's got two strikes against her in the eyes of these dudes. Like, so they're not really considering her a threat or an issue. And so they would talk quite openly about their plans in front of people of colour and probably more so in front of women of colour. And so there are letters that suggest that one of the servants of the household happened to pass on information about Major Andre going to West Point, expecting never to return. And considering a lot of the servants in the households at the time were women of colour, one of whom being Elizabeth, nothing to stop her passing on that info, is there? See, Elizabeth was enslaved originally, and she was owned, ugh, I hate saying that, by this colonel who ends up giving her permission to leave and they're like, what's happened to Liz? And they're like, eh, it's fine, don't worry about it. Like, she's gone, don't expect to find her again. So off she goes. And she ends up working in the Townsend's house. And so when she's there, there, I mean, there's army officers going in and out. So her collecting information isn't weird. And Robert Townsend purchases, and I quote, a wench, which was a term which was used to degrade women of colour back in the days. I know we like to see like tavern wench and yada yada yada. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a racism thing. It's a sexism, then racism thing as soon as it crossed the pond. I know. Why are we surprised? And so Elizabeth is <sighs> enslaved by the Townsends. And then when the British leave, so does Elizabeth. But there aren't any like notifications or reports of any runaway slaves. It's just she's not there. But Elizabeth's name like shows up like over and over again in the logbooks of Robert Townsend's store. And Elizabeth is pregnant, right? And so she asks Robert to buy her back, which he does. Was he the father? Was someone else the father? Does it matter? He, you know, he gets her. And she goes to live in his apartment. And after this, she gives birth to a biracial boy, a light-skinned child, named Harry. Robert then sells Elizabeth on to this widow, like her and Harry get sold to this widow, under the condition that they cannot be sold on to anyone else, but they can be sold back to Robert Townsend. But there's a twist in the tale because the widow remarries and her new husband sells Elizabeth, not Harry, sells Elizabeth. And when Robert Townsend finds out, he is livid and he goes to get her back. And he does. And he smuggles her back in to New York. And when Elizabeth returns to New York... She does not do so as an enslaved person. She does so as a free woman. And it's at this point that she becomes a servant. And as such is in the perfect position to be Agent 355. Like, how perfect would that be? Someone who was enslaved, someone who had to fight for their freedom, who then helps another country fight for their freedom. Isn't that amazing? Aren't women just amazing. But could she really have been Agent 355? Would Woodhull have referred to her as Lady? Maybe, maybe not. Like, who knows how progressive he was, but... 355. Was it Elizabeth? Was it Lydia? Anna Strong, or even the woman on the ship? Like... All of the efforts of all of the women, like, during this time, there's probably more. Of course there's more. Because, like, women make up half the population and you're telling me they didn't do shit? Pfft. Nonsense. Balderdash. But yes. We don't write down history. Like, if it's about a man, the every man, it's, it's history. If it's about the every woman, it's gender studies, in it. But who was Agent 355? Wherever she was, good fucking luck to her. And I'll raise a glass in her name tonight. And so ends our story.
of Agent 355. If you liked my little rambling retelling, uh, feel free to rate and review five stars. If it's not five stars, shh, don't worry about it. Say nothing. It's fine. Just don't, just don't bother. Um, recommendation time, because I haven't done a recommendation in a while. We have, what do we have? We have reading, Widowland. Read Widowland. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. Just go for it. For watching Agatha all along. I'm sorry, it's on. I really, I really enjoyed it. Like the second time I watched it, I enjoyed it more. We're only two episodes in, but like the second time really hits you. And for listening, listen to me. No, listen to, you know what? Listen to the For Love, For the Love of History podcast. TK is amazing. She's so lovely and she gives a lot of fun, interesting stuff. Anyway, um, this was supposed to be a bitty sewed, but it, it was supposed to be a little fun padding. But my hands were, uh, my hands were, um, something. I've forgotten the words. It's too late. It's like, shit, it's 2 a.m. Okay. I am going to wish you good night. Adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friend. Bye bye.